Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the third virtual dialogue that the UN Women Training Center is hosting in 2016. My name is Clementia Munoz, and I'm the head of UN Women's Training Center. Today, we will be discussing an issue of great importance for our field, the professionalization of gender trainers. We are very fortunate to have with us participants from across the globe and who belong to a range of organizations, from governments and civil society to international organizations, UN agencies, and academia. Together, they make up the UN Women Training Center Community of Practice. We're also honored today to be joined by experts, panelists, who will share their insights on the professionalization of training for gender equality. Allow me to welcome Lina Abu Habib, Executive Director of the Women Learning Partnership, Soline Blanchard, Lecturer and Research Fellow at the University of Lausanne, Switzerland, and Hector Martin Frias, Subdirector of Gender Training at Mexico's National Women's Institute. Hector will be delivering his presentation in Spanish, and we will then provide a summary in English. Today's webinar will be moderated by Lucy Ferguson, who is a consultant for the UN Women Training Center. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly speak about the UN Women Training Center community of practice. As some of you may know, this is an open platform of 1,800 experts, academics, and practitioners in training for gender equality. Virtual dialogues host by the community of practice are a mechanism, is a mechanism for us as training practitioners to continually discuss, exchange, and share knowledge and lessons learned, as well as to nurture a community for collective learning across the world. Today we're hosting this webinar as part of our ninth virtual dialogue. We're here today to discuss the professionalization of gender trainers. But what do we mean by professionalization? The growing popularity of training for gender equality is driving rising demand for expert trainers. Yet, there is little agreement about what qualifications are required to deliver training for gender equality, how these are to be gained, and what professional ethics should guide their work. At UN Women, we understand training for gender equality to be a feminist project involving feminist knowledge transfer. We believe it must adhere to certain core values which also guide our work at the training center. These are human rights, personal transformation as part of social transformation, participatory non-hierarchical and power sharing learning, inclusiveness and respect for diversity, and innovation and creativity. This way in which trainers work, however, is not always aligned with these understanding. This is why we need to discuss issues like professionalization standards or professional standards, ethics and quality assurance mechanisms to make training for gender equality live up, live up to its transformative potential. The overall objective of our virtual dialogue is to discuss the professionalization of gender training. That is to look at how gender trainings are currently trained or made, what qualifications they should have, what criteria they should meet, what kinds of professional ethics they should uphold, how this should be decided and by whom, and what are the opportunities and limitations of classifications. Today's webinar offers a space for reflection that will support you and women and our stakeholders to move towards more transformative training for gender equality worldwide. I will now hand over to Lucy to begin moderating the session. Thank you, Clemencia, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, today we will be having four presentations, each of five minutes, and we'll follow that by a round of questions 
from the those listening in. In order to participate, please use the toolbar on the GoToWebinar webinar platform and you can type in a question at any time. The total time of the webinar will be just under one hour and a half and we'll try and leave as much time as possible for the question and answer session in order to make it as dynamic as possible within this format. Any questions that we are not able to discuss during the webinar will be posted onto the Community of Practice, Practice platform. There will also be a report of the webinar and the broader virtual dialogue within, it is, within which it is situated. There are two key questions to reflect on for this virtual dialogue. First, what professional qualifications ethics and criteria should gender trainers adhere to? And second, what are the opportunities and limitations of such professional classifications? We have four presenters today who Clemencia has already introduced. Our first presentation will be from Lina Abu Habib. Lena is the Executive Director of the Women Learning Partnership based in the US. She's also Executive Director of the Collective for Research and Training on Development Action based in Lebanon and a Middle East and North Africa Regional Advisor for the Global Fund for Women. Lena has vast experience in developing capacities for gender mainstreaming and has written extensively on training for gender equality. She has collaborated with regional and international organizations in mainstreaming gender in development policies and practices, including UN Women, ESQUA, and the Royal Tropical Institute. She was also the secretary and the president of the Association for Women's Rights in Development, AWID, between 2008 and 2012. Welcome, Lena. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to try to be very brief. Uh, um, first of all, thank you for this initiative. It's um, the questions that are posed are really important to reflect on. Um, I, I started by thinking. First of all, let me just preface this by saying um, this is essentially based on my own uh, experience in doing gender training in several parts of the world and within several contexts and within several institutions. And uh, there has been definitely in the past few years uh, kind of a pro proliferation of uh, uh, gender trainers. Uh, and that is why I propose to start by reflecting now who would be considered a gender trainer. Um, again, these are my own, uh, my own observations, so which probably cannot be generalized. Um, I've always felt that this was a function or a title which is really by, by self-appointment, uh, which comes through practice, through contacts, and very much through supply and demand. Uh, aside, from, uh, uh, aside from some solid courses, one of which does not exist, which used to be with the Regional Tropical Institute, there, there's very little formal training uh, that is required to become uh, a gender trainer. And one of the things that uh, uh, I find alarming um, that there's very little value given to the fact that uh, the gender trainer is in fact a vector for transmitting knowledge on feminist theory. In fact, um, very few have this kind of knowledge or uh, consider that this knowledge is essential. Uh, in general, a gender trainer is somebody who has to be uh, uh, acceptable and ac to the audience and accepted by the audience, which means that um, uh, we, uh, not we myself, but in general, uh, uh, the key issues of structural issues related to inequality, patriarchy, uh, 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 discriminations are not really tackled as the foundations of gender inequality. The most is, so what happens is that we see many gender trainers diluting these key issues 
And just to make sure that you're going to be called on again, basically uh, uh, you have to deliver something that is soft, that is acceptable, that does not disrupt uh, the, patriarchal, the patriarchal order. And that's why, actually, if you look at impact, if you look at results, it's very difficult to find uh, instances where it has been transformed, where, where, where such, where a gender trainer has been a vector for transforming mindsets. Uh, um, I think that uh, the, many of people in the pool of gender trainers um, are actually technic te technical people at, at, uh, at best. It's very unfortunate that we're looking in, at a situation where what counts is what the client wants. In some case, cases, what the client wants is uh, for the participants to be able to fill out a log frame or to be able to, de to, to develop a checklist, etc. And therefore, this is very far from what we consider to be the professional ethics uh, for training for gender equality, which is one of the points that you have asked us to reflect on, uh, which for me are actually can be can be summarized into six um, six uh, very important key professional ethics. One of which is actually that there the person should have a personal, uh, an individual, uncompromising commitment to gender equality and to women's rights as human rights, unless unless a gender trainer. Uh, actually uses a human rights framework, a framework that is actually uh, 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 that is in harmony with international human rights and human rights uh, instruments, um, it doesn't work or it's not uh, uh, within a transformatory uh, process. Uh, secondly, a serious understanding of what is gender equality, what is inequality, how do we get to a situation of inequality, what moves us from inequality to equality, the fact that there are no buts and ifs to, to equality, which means that we should have an understanding of the various wicked ways in which patriarchy functions, uh, how patriarchy infiltrates institutions, policies, politics, uh, uh, practices, uh, uh, attitudes, etc. Uh, the fourth professional ethic, and, uh, ethic uh, which has really disturbed me quite a lot in many cases, which is you do find sometimes that some, some, of, some gender trainers come with um, a certain view of cultural relativism. That, it's, that equality means different things in different places depending on the context and in the culture. And that is, uh, that is seriously problematic. Uh, as I said, uh, and related to my first point, there is no way around a full commitment to international human rights and women's rights framework and also a commitment to challenge any hidden agenda because the status quo in relation to gender inequality is actually very beneficial to many people and many institutions. And unless we come there with an idea to disrupt it and challenge it, then you know uh, I don't think we're really fulfilling the job of a gender trainer. So uh, how do we measure? How do we uh, how do we evaluate? What kind of indicators, in my view, uh, uh, as to whether or not um, uh, something has happened in terms of transformation at the end of a gender training uh, as a result of the input, the contribution uh, uh, of a gender trainer. I think we need to leave our audiences with questions, questions about the ways they were raised, questions about the way they do things, questions about uh, how they think the way they think, questions about uh, inequality, etc. We should leave people with an ability to link the private, their private lives to the public sphere. And that is not an easy thing to do. Because unless this divide between private and public is challenged, um, we, have, we have had very little impact that can be measured and evaluated. We have to be able to leave, uh, uh, as gender trainers, to leave uh, our audience with at least uh, a curiosity or uh, an interest or at best a commitment to be able to disrupt patriarchal realities, at least to stop accepting patriarchal re realities. We should leave them with feminist knowledge. We must, have, we must be able 
to transmit that knowledge, to uh, 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 to leave people curious with going and to look for more knowledge, more understanding of uh, 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 feminist theory. And at the end of the day, I think if I were to interview a gender trainer, I would like to find out if this person has a political commitment. I am not at all interested in a technical person, in a person who's going to be able to do an RBM or a lock frame or whatever, uh, all these tools. I would like to see, I would like to tr uh, evaluate this person by the level of her or his commitment to all the things, all the ethics that I have uh, uh, mentioned before. Thank you. I think I don't didn't even get to five minutes. Thank you, Lena, for uh, an extremely stimulating and very succinct presentation. We look forward to hearing more from you in the questions. Uh, we now turn to our second presenter, Hector Frias. Hector is the Subdirector of Gender Training and Education at Mexico's National Women's Institute in Mujeres, a position he has held since 2003. He has over 15 years of experience in training for gender equality and capacity development. He previously worked as a parliamentary advisor to Mexico's Equity and Gender Commission and its External Relations Commission. Hector is also a spokesperson for laws and policies on paternity leave. An active promoter for responsible fatherhood and new masculinities, he is dedicated to working with partners to run the reflection space, man, of course. Hector will be giving his presentation in Spanish. Um, for those of you who, who don't follow Spanish, uh, we will be sh giving a short summary at the end in English, and also we would ask to refer you to uh, the report which will be produced of the webinar and the virtual dialogue when we will have a more substantive uh, explanation of Hector's presentation along with all the others. So Hector, welcome and when you're ready. Thank you. Okay, muchas gracias. Buenos días a todas y a todos. Eh, antes que nada, eh, agradezco a la eh, organización, a ONU Mujeres, por esta actividad eh, con el propósito de mejorar la, la docencia que llevan a cabo las capacitadoras y capacitadores en género. Esta intervención pretende apenas aportar algunas ideas generales para la reflexión y el debate de la población con la que trabajamos cotidianamente difundiendo los principios, conocimientos sobre igualdad entre mujeres y hombres. Eh, quisiera eh, advertir que pues mucho de lo que diga está basado en mi propia experiencia y por lo tanto habrá mucho de subjetivo en mi participación. Primero, creo que las cuestiones de género pasaron de ser eh, poco conocidas entre la población en general y entre las y los servidores públicos en los ministerios de Estado y ahora son una necesidad importante para hacer frente a los compromisos del gobierno mexicano, en este caso, en materia de derechos humanos de las mujeres, sobre todo el derecho a la igualdad y a una vida libre de violencia eh, que están plasmados en... Eh, tratados internacionales. Esto para ser coherente también con el impulso de una política nacional para la igualdad que requiere de servidores y servidoras públicas que cuenten 
con competencias conceptuales, procedimentales y actitudinales que les permitan desarrollar mejor su tarea de diseño, instrumentación y ejecución de proyectos, programas y políticas públicas en favor de la igualdad. Y segundo, también las áreas de capacitación que disponían de personal eh, poco calificado, de recursos económicos también incipientes, de recursos didácticos y pedagógicos apenas desarrollándose, ahora se han convertido también por necesidad en otras áreas donde hay cada vez personal más experimentado, donde también se echa a mano de los recursos tecnológicos y ahora se ha pasado de la capacitación presencial también a aprovechar las ventajas de la capacitación en línea o de proyectos combinados. Esto nos lleva ahora a una pregunta que tiene que ver con los criterios que deben cumplir quienes capacitan en género. La siguiente lámina, por favor. Y eh, para que una persona pueda cumplir con estos criterios básicos para capacitar a otras personas en género, es importante lo siguiente. Uno, que además de su experiencia práctica, se prepare y profundice en aspectos teóricos, en este caso relacionados, como han dicho, eh, con el feminismo, que también se actualicen en aspectos relativos a la docencia, a la pedagogía, sobre todo a la andragogía, que es la educación con personas adultas, y que adquieran aprendizajes teóricos sobre los principales aspectos de la didáctica para elaborar programas educativos y algunos otros aspectos que tengan que ver con manejo de grupos, dinámica de grupos, evaluar el aprendizaje, sin descontar, por supuesto, todo lo que tiene que ver con feminismo, masculinidades, género y su relación con otros factores de discriminación, brechas de desigualdad, entre otros aspectos. ¿Cuáles son, digamos, los principales desafíos? En la siguiente lámina, por favor, que este, presenta la población que capacita en género. Bueno, una, que haya una tendencia a reclutar como capacitadores y capacitadoras en género a personas que provienen de distintas carreras, que no sean necesariamente este, pedagogía. Continuar con prácticas que no son del todo recomendables, como alta rotación del personal en áreas de capacitación en las instituciones gubernamentales, que no se impulsen proyectos tendientes a homogenizar los procedimientos y los contenidos mínimos de calidad en la capacitación de género, y de ahí surgen entonces varias oportunidades. Necesitamos aprovechar precisamente la diversidad de conocimientos y saberes de estas personas que se dedican a otros temas y enriquecerlos, como habíamos dicho, con eh, aspectos pedagógicos, didácticos, para mejorar la profesionalización y la capacitación en género. Necesitamos explorar experiencias de las personas que han demostrado que son buenas técnicas manejando los temas de género relacionados con eh, sus conferencias y sus actividades de capacitación, pero reforzándolas, brindándoles cursos de actualización y de especialización sobre temas muy especiales que tienen que ver ya con cuestiones políticas de aplicación de la perspectiva de género en el diseño de las políticas públicas. Necesitamos también desarrollar programas o estrategias de profesionalización, por ejemplo, certificando en algunas funciones claves a estas personas para que comúnmente, cotidianamente, eh, hagan mejor su trabajo. ¿De quién depende esto? ¿Quién tendría que decidirlo? Pues en primera instancia es un compromiso también ético, personal, de la propia eh, persona que capacita por hacer un esfuerzo por profundizar en sus conocimientos. Dos, es una responsabilidad de las instituciones que les contratan para eh, hacer mejores eh, diagnósticos de necesidades de capacitación, para mejorar y afinar la capacitación. Finalmente es una capacitación para el trabajo, pensando en servidoras y servidores públicos, para que lo realicen mejor. Y este eh, sería una tendencia que deberíamos de cuidar en todas partes del mundo. Y quizá 
una propuesta también interesante sería ejercicios como este que hace ONU Mujeres en este momento, pues que podríamos ponernos de acuerdo para unificar cuáles son estos criterios mínimos que mejorarían la capacitación en género. Bueno, discúlpenme, creo que me colgué en el tiempo. Este... No, no pasa nada. Perfecto. Sí. Muchas gracias, Héctor. Thank you very much, Hector, for the presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, I'd give a brief overview of the presentation. Um, Hector gave an interesting trajectory of the, kind, the establishment of gender training in Mexico around 15 years ago and how that's evolved and changed and uh, then led to a point of reflecting on uh, at what stage are we at for the, in the professionalization of trainers. Um, in terms of the criteria for gender trainers, he proposed that, uh, that it's important to have training on design, delivery and evaluation of training and also to look at aspects such uh, as group management, classroom dynamics and adult learning. And um, on the other side, to deepen, for trainers to deepen their knowledge of the relationship and the intersection between gender and other factors and hierarchies, and to work more deeply on understanding a gender perspective and other aspects of um, feminist work and theory. In terms of who can, uh, might decide or manage these criteria, he proposed uh, commissioning institutions the agencies and state bodies that monitor equality policies and national women's machineries. And I think there's some very interesting points to discuss there. In terms of the main challenges of professionalization, Hector highlighted uh, a, a remaining and persistent tendency for commissioning institutions to hire trainers without specific gender expertise uh, and other bad practices such as high staff turnover and highlighted again the issue of the lack of minimum quality standards at national, regional and international levels. However, in terms of opportunities, Hector suggested that there are good opportunities to leverage the diversity of knowledge and skills in particular in terms of those who have uh, knowledge in other areas and other areas of technical expertise and also to uh, draw on the experience of those who are trained in gender to develop some uh, refresher courses and training courses to take the professionalization forward and at the end of his presentation he proposed to continue the conversation with UN women and other actors on working together to uh, develop some of these criteria in a collective manner. Our next presentation will be from Soline Blanchard. Welcome Soline. Soline is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. She previously worked at the University of Toulouse in France and was a postdoctoral researcher at the School for Advanced Studies in Social Science. Soline's research focuses on gender equality and inequality in the workplace, a subject on which she's written and published numerous articles. She's also conducted research and published widely on the professionalization of gender trainers and gender consultants. Prominent events in which she has taken part include those held in relation to the European Commission Queen Project Quality in Gender Plus equalities. Soline, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, hello everybody. So um, I will present here some uh, observation based on my PhD research on the professionalization of gender trainers and consultants in France uh, specialized in the field uh, of gender equality at work um, and hope this will help for a global discussion. So for uh, this discussion, I will first introduce what I mean by professionalization of gender trainers and then I will provide some insights on the questions I've been asked. So uh, first, uh, according to the sociological literature, professionalization can be defined as a process by which a given group of workers gain two elements. First, a monopoly on the existing activity 
and second, the ability to define on their own the content of such activity, that is to say, what is to be done and how. So, professionalization is all about getting social recognition, political legitimacy and autonomy, and expertise plays a key role in such a process. Indeed, the claim and recognition of expertise is a main stake to justify the access to a privileged situation on the labor market as it endorses that a given group of workers do hold specific knowledge to tackle a public concern and that no other people hold this knowledge and are able to do the job. Finally, professionalization mainly takes two different tracks, a top-down track encouraged by the public bodies and a bottom-up track fostered by the workers themselves. So, bearing this in mind, I will give some insights uh, on the two questions uh, I've been asked. Can the professionalization of gender trainers better ensure the production and transfer of feminist knowledge? Here, I will say that it can, but it is not self-evident. Indeed, a quick overview of the field of gender training reveals some tension and uncertainty. Um, on the one hand, gender trainers' backgrounds, representations and practices var vary largely and this results in internal fragmentation. For instance, uh, profiles of gender trainers are very diverse, including feminist activists, young graduates in gender studies or, or trainers who have discovered gender on the job. Furthermore, there is no consensus on the definition of gender equality, uh, such a disagreement echoing uh, directly uh, the debates uh, in academia and women's movements about the various conceptions of uh, feminism. As a direct corollary, uh, practitioners don't agree on what gender training is about and what kind of expertise is required for uh, this activity. On the other hand, there are, no, there are specific external constraints. Support of gender equality varies uh, in time and is largely aimed in the specific economic and political agenda of the clients, commissioners and employees of gender trainers. Moreover, um, there is obvious resistance to gender training, often coupled with a specific stigma associated with feminism. So there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the process of professionalization of gender training. This activity is still a work in progress. Its definition is a matter of dispute and competition. Uh, and this carries on a risk of depolitization and dilution of the feminist perspective. So that the key questions here are uh, what kind of expertise will be established, by whom and how. And finally, the ability to ensure the production and transfer of feminist knowledge will depend on the ability of gender trainers to set on their own feminist standards for their activity. Here, uh, I argue that this includes uh, a, a strong and political definition of gender. Uh, to pay special attention to resistance uh, to gender training and deal with them, and to establish principles about the way gender training is designed and conducted, including dimensions such as participation, inclusion, and reflexivity. So, second, how can we ensure that the professional standards for gender trainers are developed in a participatory, inclusive, and bottom-up manner? Um, this is a tricky question, uh, as there seems to be an inherent contradiction between the process of professionalization and the feminist principles of participation and inclusion. Indeed, as I said earlier, professionalization is about claiming professional expertise, which should be the only property of a specific group of workers. So it is about setting authoritative knowledge, and this goes along with power relations. It is a source of exclusion, as it means choosing which criteria should be in or out, and as a consequence, who should be considered as an expert or not. It is also a source of hierarchy, external hierarchy, as it states that professional experts are the more legitimate to tackle a given issue, and internal hierarchy, as it creates an ideal type of the good expert not every professional can match with. So here, uh, the question is how to challenge this tendency toward exclusion and hierarchy while setting standards for uh, gender trainers. Uh, here, I argue that this includes uh, recognizing the variety of sources of feminist knowledge, 
and tackling the multiple power relations gender training is caught in and may contribute to, contribute to reproduce both internally among gender trainers and externally with the different stakeholders, uh, whether they be trainees, academics, uh, feminist activists, etc. Internally, it means, uh, for instance, taking into account the plurality of contexts and the complexity of situations gender trainers may face, taking seriously the tension between cooperation and competition among professionals uh, on the labor and services market, or questioning the gender, race, class, language, north house, and other power relations among gender trainers in the process of setting standards. So finally, uh, there is a need for a multi-level open and autonomous spaces where any and all gender trainers can discuss these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Celine, for an excellent, uh, very clear presentation. Our final presentation will come from Clemencia Munoz Tamayo, who has been chief of the UN Women Training Center since 2011. Clemencia has over 20 years of experience in international development and gender, having worked for UNIFEM and UNDP, both in the field and at headquarters. She has also served as the Kellogg Foundation's Head of Office for Mexico and Central America and has worked with the National Planning Ministry of Colombia. She's also currently a member of the Mexican Council on Foreign Relations, COMEXI. Clemencia, we we'll go back to you now to begin your presentation. Clemencia. Okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Uh, I would like to share the views from the UN Training Center also based on our experience regarding this topic and to address three main questions. Um, so what do we mean by professionalization of gender trainers? What are the opportunities and challenges of professionalization of gender trainers? And what are the key elements to consider for professionalization of gender trainers? We have served within the UN and we didn't found any definition uh, on professionalization certification or the like. So um, going back to the, the first question, so why is it important? What is the thinking behind? I think much has been said already in, in the previous presentations, but we wanted to summarize three points. Points. One is uh, the fact that it is grounded on extensive evidence that gender equality and women's empowerment is a game changer for advancing human development, human rights and equality for all as set out by the global normative framework such as CEDAW, Beijing, SDGs. Uh, it is also an attempt to acknowledge the field of training for gender equality and the contribution of training to advance human development and influence social transformation. And it is an effort to enhance and ensure quality and standard norms for training for gender equality. In sum, uh, uh, for us here in the training center, it is an effort to acknowledge and recognize the field of training for gender equality, which is an emerging, demanded, it has been said by previous uh, presenters as well. It is constantly evolving and still in the making. Gender training is grounded upon different social, political, economic, and economic contexts and consequently changes over time. This was also mentioned by the previous presenters. Because the field is still in the making and relatively small, there is room to define and create consensus of what it means and what it entails and hence the importance of this discussion today as a first um, approach to it. Regarding opportunities and challenges, we have summarized a few of, of we selected some of them, but we think that, that are appropriate for our discussion today, but they're not in any way exhaustive. So as re regarding opportunities, uh, we think the effort that we are engaging uh, today 
elicits discussions, dialogues, and, and exchanges among different institutions to further advance the field. Uh, so it is, it is, again, an attempt to clarify what, why, when, who, and how to professionalize gender trainers. And the opportunity is, is also the, 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 the need to nurture consensus on, a minimum, on minimum requirements to assure quality and standards. And a third one is a further recognition of this profession. Uh, some mention institutionalization or professionalization and its contribution to advancing human development and social justice. And the fourth one, we think it's an opportunity but also a challenge, the field in the making and evolving, a, a, a field starting. So as for challenges, uh, the field in the making and evolving, while it's an opportunity, it may also be a challenge. Uh, we also think the question of authority and capacity to accredit professional gender trainers, I think it was mentioned by Soline lately. Uh, so who has the authority to accredit a professional gender trainer? Who would be the, the ideal authority, if, if, it, if at all? The second, it was also mentioned, hierarchy and politicization of knowledge. Whose knowledge counts? A third one, the role of the UN as being a UN institution in accreditation. Is it feasible or not, appropriate or not? Uh, as far as we understand, the UN does not accredit a profession, but it would be desirable in that sense to have a mixed group of credible institutions to build criteria and provide accreditation. Another challenge is the monitoring and accountability mechanisms to ensure quality standards. Once the, the trainer has been, has gone through a process of uh, in professionalization, so who is responsible for monitoring and, 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 and monitoring the accountability as well? Uh, ideally, there should be, we pr we're proposing a learning partnership or mutual accountability approach where trainers can support each other, deliver training together, and hold each other accountable. Linking to this question, who has the capacity and authority to define and manage malpractice of gender equality? which is a, another challenge that uh, we identify, the management of the malpractice. And the final challenge is uh, that the professionalization requires a process of continuously practicing and updating knowledge, skills, and experience because it's linked to a field, an evolving field that is uh, very context dependable and it changes over time. So uh, again here, uh, what an agreed system should be put in place, uh, for instance, certain number of practicing hours with positive evaluation mentioned, as I mentioned in the learning partnership approach. So our final question is, what are the key elements to consider for, for this professionalization of gender trainers? So we have come up with a vision situating the training in the broader process of change for social and gender justice. This was also mentioned differently by other of the panelists. Knowledge, exploring the, of course, knowledge around gender equality and women's rights, exploring the nature of knowledge, imparting knowledge and knowing. Qualification, identifying if there is a set of minimum uh, identifying or agreeing on a minimum set of requirements for trainers to ensure quality and standards, and the competency, identifying level of practical experience in human development work, knowledge of learning methodologies and pedagogies, experiences in facilitation and communication. Um, regarding uh, knowledge, I think it was also mentioned by, by someone what knowledge is important, how knowledge is generated and selected, how knowledge is transferred, shared, exchanged or learned, how do we know that we learn, how do we know that the learning happens, so we have more questions than uh, responses. Uh, again, and we always think in terms of minimum requirements to be agreed by a mixed of groups, not by, to be set by us or any, I mean a set of credible institutions, not just us or any other institution. 
and the competency again is also a minimum set which is uh, to be set also by a group of institutions. We, w we wanted to take this opportunity, to the next slide uh, please, we wanted to take this opportunity to share uh, that we are currently partnering with the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam uh, to develop a professional development course for gender trainers. We are working with Dr. Franz Wong, Ms. Chloe Bast, and Matraye Mukopadai. Uh, and this joint uh, collaboration emanated from our recommendation of our own expert group meeting held in 2015 that uh, the group called for visiting and reviewing the way gender trainers are trained and professionalized. The mapping um, exercise examined what constitutes gender knowledge and how gender training has been approached, what exactly is the nature of gender ex expertise and in what ways it is specialized. Thinking about gender expertise can be thought of in three ways, knowledge, experience, and skills. The exercise also examined feminist implications for gender trainers and practice, and this was an attempt to understand the context in which gender trainers work and dimensions around it. The mapping exercise took a broad view of existing initiatives to professionalize gender trainers to identify strengths, shortcoming gaps, modalities for such courses. And Therefore, based on, on these mapping exercises, the UN Women Training Center and the Royal Tropical Institute are working together to design and pilot a professional development course for gender trainers. I think it's enough. Uh, we have another slide with a summary of what we have done, but that this is just uh, for information. So I think this, this would be enough from our side. Thank you. Okay, Clemencia, thank you very much for the presentation. I'll just leave that slide for the background as I am explaining now as we move on to the questions. Uh, we've had lots of questions from our participants in the audience and the way in which we're going to proceed is to look at three questions. We'll take each question in turn, and what I will ask is for each of the presenters to respond to the three questions, or which of those they feel are they are most able to respond to, and we will take it in turn of the presenters. So, Lena, um, I will turn to you first to have a look at the questions and feel free to answer one or all three of those. I will just read those um, for information. The first question for the presenters. Who decides what cultural background meets the bar for determining an objective view of gender equality from married? The second question, how can gender trainers be evaluated in political terms rather than in technical terms from Obono Jean? And the third question, what role does the ethical dimension play in the professionalization of gender training? That's from Eduardo. So, Lena, I will I will pass the floor to you now to respond. Yeah, sure. Thank you. These are interesting questions. I want to react uh, or speak to the uh, cultural thing. Uh, I think we would be really wrong to bring culture into the dimension uh, because there is there aren't cultures culture culture specific definitions of human rights or equality or discrimination. I think that's what I was trying to say, that um, the, the framework, the, the, the philosophy, uh, uh, the conceptual framework of gender change should be within uh, the framework of international human rights definitions and instruments. Um, 
and, and not be framed according to what is accepted or not accepted in one culture or another. Uh, regardless of the fact of what we consider to be culture, but when we go down that road, we know very well that um, uh, 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 we that women uh, tend to lose when we go back to culture and we go back to framing what is accepted, what is acceptable to uh, in terms of uh, uh, culture. Um, in terms of being evaluated in political rather than uh, in uh, 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 technical terms, for me it's about uh, how do we know that this person has a personal, individual commitment, political commitment, to uh, equality, to women's rights as human rights. And that is not an easy task, uh, that is not an easy task to do, but there are some indicators that are useful. One of them is, is culture <laughs> actually a reference for us or not? And I would be very wary if culture is used as, as a reference. One of the things that uh, in the Women Learning Partnership uh, that is important for us is that our framework globally in every country where we work is international human rights and women's rights instruments. Now the way you might uh, frame an intervention or the way you might choose a case study or a story, uh, uh, you may want it to be quote unquote culturally relevant, but at the end of the day there are no compromises and no diluting of international human rights uh, uh, concepts, values, uh, uh, etc. Uh, I think I'll stop here uh, uh, because I think I took too much time. I, I haven't responded to the third question, but maybe we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, if you want to take the time to respond, that's okay because we still have we still have some time, so uh, you don't need to rush. All right. I think because the third question is really in 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 a way, at least the way I see it, it's linked to the second because uh, uh, the. The ethical dimension, uh, or the way I see it, is linked to that personal political uh, uh, commitment to international human rights, to women's rights as, as human rights, and to a global, universal understanding of what equality of what equality is. So, so, so for me, they are not they are not dissociated. To the contrary, uh, they um, um, Looking at evaluating, measuring uh, a gender treatment from the perspective of a political, a political understanding and commitment versus technical is in fact uh, 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 very much an ethical dimension in my, in my sense. Thank you. Thank you. That's very clear. Um, Hector, eh, voy a intentar traducir un poco las preguntas lo mejor que pueda. La primera pregunta, ¿quién decide qué tipo de contexto cultural vale para determinar una perspectiva objetiva de la igualdad de género? Es la primera. Segunda, ¿cómo se puede evaluar a las formadoras, los formadores de género en términos políticos Um, y no en términos técnicos. Es decir, la pregunta es cómo se puede evaluar la parte política. Y la tercera pregunta, ¿qué papel tiene la dimensión ética en estos procesos de profesionalización de la capacitación, la formación de género? ¿Puedes responder a todas las preguntas o las que te interesan? Sí. Bueno, yo creo que están muy interconectadas y respondiendo tal vez una, vayan decantando respuestas para las otras. Yo creo que eh, es como difícil en un sentido decir eh, como qué tipo de soporte cultural deben tener este, o determinar eh, los puntos de vista objetivos para de los capacitadores o formadores en género. Sin embargo, desde otro punto de vista es como muy sencillo, porque creo que lo importante aquí es que sean personas comprometidas, convencidas eh, de la perspectiva de los derechos humanos, de la no discriminación y de la igualdad. En ese sentido, ¿cómo evaluarles políticamente? 
pues también tiene que ver con su compromiso eh, con estos temas, con la lucha por el reconocimiento de estos derechos humanos de las mujeres, por el reconocimiento del derecho a la igualdad y a la no discriminación. Y eh, todo esto pues, pasa por una posición también ética. ¿no? Decíamos que quién decide en qué y cómo se profesionalizan las personas que dan capacitación en género y que forman a otros eh, servidores públicos o a la población en general, eh, bueno, pues se forman a partir de este compromiso que tienen por eh, promover los principios de la igualdad, independientemente de sus creencias, incluso eh, morales o de tipo religioso o de algún otro este, corte. Lo más importante es comprometerse pues, con esta visión de los derechos que tenemos todas las personas, independientemente si somos hombres, mujeres, independientemente de la preferencia sexual, independientemente de cuestiones raciales y demás. Yo creo que ese es como el hilo conductor que eh, responde como a las tres preguntas. Evidentemente, yo me refería a que es importante evaluar a las y los formadores en género desde el punto de vista técnico, porque también es importante que, además de los conocimientos que tengan en materia de género, pues tengan las habilidades, los conocimientos y los valores para transmitir justo, este, con esa claridad, esos principios de la igualdad y no sus posturas personales o sus creencias individuales, eh, porque las leyes, las políticas públicas en materia de género, pues deben ser como muy apegadas a estos principios. Mm -hmm. Gracias, Hector. Uh, I will just give a summary of, of Hector's response. Uh, he argued that, um, firstly, the first and third questions are closely connected because the values that we are expecting gender trainers to subscribe are those international standards and laws and practices of uh, human rights, non-discrimination, equality, regardless of, uh, regardless of background and characteristics. Um, so he sees that the ethical dimension in professionalization comes through that because there's an expected commitment to those values and to those laws and processes and that they should be enshrined within national equality laws, policies and processes. In terms of the second question, he suggested that it is important as well for gender trainers to be evaluated in technical knowledge, that he acknowledged the importance of the political dimension, but nevertheless we shouldn't um, neglect the technical aspect because it's very important also for trainers to be well informed about processes, practices and procedures of the relevant um, equality policies to which they are being asked to, uh, to train. So now I'll turn with the same questions to Soline. Uh, please answer whichever of those or all of them, whichever you would like. Uh, thank you and thank you for uh, these questions. Um, I will pick the first one and just comment that, uh, um, well, um, the, the, the feminist research uh, has uh, pointed out that the objectivity does not really exist and that, uh, well, we are talking about situated the knowledge, uh, so it's hard to talk, uh, in, in my view, uh, about uh, objective view on gender equality uh, and I think we will rather put subjectivity in the debate and uh, take into account uh, the, the context and the, the positions of the, the different stakeholders, be them uh, the trainers, the trainees and the institution and so on. So uh, that will be my, just a comment on the, maybe on this question. Um, the second, how can gender trainers be uh, in the political terms? Uh, well, um, here um, I, I will say that uh, 
uh, it's uh, important to have uh, both um, elements and that uh, contribution to social change may be uh, the, the core issue here and also uh, the resistance uh, uh, that have the trainers face because resistance means that uh, something uh, is uh, annoying and if it's annoying it's a, um, a token that we're working on change on social change so here I will uh, focus more on resistance and a contribution to social change which is uh, hard to um, to evaluate and that 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 is a link with the, the third question um, it's hard to uh, evaluate the quality of the the outputs of the, the trainings, especially when you only do a short, uh, one-shot training. So here, um, I think here uh, the ethical dimension of uh, professionalization is uh, central. Uh, it's central because uh, training is uh, exerting power, and so uh, if we want to exert power in a feminist way, uh, we have to think about ethics, so and ethics in the processes, and I think that maybe it's easier to to have standards on this ethical dimension than to think about the, the outputs. Uh, this is a really really complicated question to 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 evaluate the outputs uh, uh, of trainings. So that would Thank be you. it. <laughs> Thank you, Celine. Uh, Clemencia, would you like to? Um, intervene on any of the questions. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the questions. I think uh, much has been said, but I'd like to insist on the first one that uh, we have the international framework on gender equality, women's rights, and human rights at large, and this has been commonly agreed. Perhaps CEDAW is one of the conventions, if not the most, uh, agreed by member states. So. This is our starting point and this is uh, the, the context in general. Uh, regarding the second one, it's uh, politically it means, as Solin was just saying, the commitment to gender equality and social transformation. And uh, we don't think you can assess one or the other. It's, we, are, we evaluate a trainer comprehensively. They're not excluding. But we don't evaluate the actions post Facto. This is one of the challenges of training. The, the training cannot be easily measured in terms of impact and political is an impact that uh, succeed or not succeed, follows the training. Um, so it cannot be evaluated necessarily on the training, but rather we were speaking before about the profile of the trainers professionally and it has to have both technical, political, and uh, pedagogical skills to, to be a comprehensive uh, quality trainer. Uh, as all of the, the colleagues have said, uh, the, the questions are linked, and, and ethics is very much linked again to the commitment to gender equality, to adhering to these global standards commonly agreed by the world. Uh, but we can say that ethics is also the aim to ensure the quality, not to create harm, uh, and not to contribute to perpetuate patriarchy, meaning training for gender equality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clemencia. Um, we now have a, a second slide of further questions. We'll be finished in, in time for or it would be good if we can take some further questions. And um, I would like the presenters again to have a look at the questions, please, and reflect on them. We'll take them in the same order, again, of the presentations. And I will also read the questions out. First, do gender trainers need to be feminist activists and subscribe to feminist ideologies? That's a question posed um, from Al which was also a discussion in the virtual dialogue. If so, how do we deal with the right reality of diverse feminisms? From Ana Paola. The second question, is it possible to transmit feminist knowledge without questioning existing power structures which are discriminatory and promote hierarchy? 
from Tapate. And thirdly, how can we include an intercultural perspective in gender mainstreaming from Roberta? Uh, and if I may just take um, moderator's prerogative and ask a further question if anyone's interested to answer it, which is something that came up across all of the presentations and it was a question that all the presenters asked and that question is about what kinds of institutions should and could guide this process of professionalization and quality standards and what, if any, is an appropriate role for the UN Women Training Center in that process. I would like to answer. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that the, the, the questions are very, at least this set of questions are very much uh, linked. Um, I think if we agree that uh, a main objective or main purpose of gender training is to transmit knowledge, so whether the person has to be a gender activist, a feminist activist, is really a no-brainer. Um, and I think one of the things to be transmitted uh, in whichever way that is possible, depending on this skill, the trainer. It's actually about gender theory and how the discourse has evolved, and the differences, the differences, uh, the intersections, uh, the diversity, etc. Um, I can't even imagine a serious gender trainer uh, who is not a feminist uh, and a feminist activist. But despite the diversities, I think the point of departure, uh, which I believe guides all of us as feminists, is, is that, that there are serious reasons, historical reasons for this inequality, that patriarchy is a main issue for women, and, then so, and that something has to, has to be done to change the situation, to disrupt it, to challenge it, to change it. Um, as long as we all start from this point of departure, um, uh, whether or the, 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 question, the questions become, uh, I don't want to say irrelevant, but not, not, not necessary. And that's number one. Number two, that's exactly my point in terms of difference between political and technical. Uh, for me, a, a gender trainer with political commitment, it's a commitment to feminism. It's a commitment to um, uh, challenging patriarchy as a, as, as a system, taking into consideration uh, uh, diversities, additional issues and intersections, and additional social categories that further uh, uh, exacerbate uh, gender, uh, gender inequality. I think that's what I have to say about these points, and they're interesting points, by the way. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Shall I move on, Lina? Okay, thanks. Um, Hector, tenemos tres preguntas otra vez y también yo había um, propuesto una, una cuarta pregunta. Entonces, si los voy traduciendo y te lo puedes responder a las que te interesan. Primero, es que las formadoras y los formadores de género tienen que ser activistas feministas y creer en las ideologías feministas. Y si es el caso, ¿Cómo se puede tratar, manejar la diversidad de los feminismos? Segundo, ¿es posible transferir el conocimiento feminista sin cuestionar las estructuras y jerarquías de, de género y discriminación? Tercero, ¿cómo se puede incluir una perspectiva intercultural en el, la transversalización de género? Y yo también había propuesto una pregunta que se ha reflexionado en todas las presentaciones de qué tipo de instituciones tendrían que o podrían guiar este proceso de profesionalización y si, si hay un papel para la, el centro de, de formación de, de ONU Mujeres en este proceso. Entonces Héctor, ¿cómo, cómo quiere responder? 
Ok. Este, mira, sí, efectivamente yo creo que no necesariamente los formadores o las formadoras en género deben ser 100% activistas eh, feministas. Sin embargo, sí creo que deben comulgar con muchos de los principios y tener esta visión eh, profeminista en el sentido de que es necesario eh, para transformar esas eh, estructuras mentales, esas ideas, creencias que perpetúan la desigualdad y la discriminación, sobre todo eh, hacia las mujeres, pues que eh, se comulguen con, con los principios de la ideología feminista y evidentemente pues ahí habrá eh, muchos puntos de vista, muchos eh, puntos que tienen que ver con estos eh, diversos feminismos que existen y cada quien tendrá como su postura. Eh, se acerca más como a la segunda pregunta, ¿no? Este, ¿Cómo es posible transmitir en una capacitación en género sobre derechos humanos, sobre igualdad, sobre no discriminación, este, pues ideas que van en contra de las jerarquías y de la eh, dominación hegemónica masculina, machista, etcétera, sin necesariamente este, comulgar con estas ideas. Eh, parecería un contrasentido. Entonces yo creo que es necesario que por lo menos si estemos convencidos y convencidas de que es necesario este, darle la razón al feminismo en ese sentido. ¿Cómo incluir la interculturalidad este, en la transversalidad o aplicación transversal del género? Bueno, al hablar precisamente de cómo el género se entrecruza con otras, eh, otros elementos que generan también discriminación, distinción, exclusión, como el hecho de pertenecer a un grupo racial, como pertenecer también a un grupo étnico y demás. En ese sentido, pues es importante que si hablamos de igualdad y de derechos humanos, pues se tome en cuenta como todos esos otros grupos, además de las mujeres este, que son eh, objeto de estas desigualdades o discriminaciones. Eh, y la cuarta pregunta, eh, ¿qué tipo de eh, instituciones deben guiar este proceso y cuál sería el papel de ONU Mujeres? Pues por ahí se mencionaban en las presentaciones efectivamente que debemos de homologar criterios, debemos de tener estándares mínimos para promover este, estos eh, temas sobre la igualdad, sobre el reconocimiento de los derechos de las mujeres, sobre la no discriminación. Y creo que el papel de ONU Mujeres es fundamental, quizá realizar este tipo de actividades, realizar actividades incluso presenciales para fijar como estos estándares, para eh, ponernos de acuerdo en cuál es lo mínimo, la mínima calidad que las personas que capacitan en género deben tener para este, reproducir esos conocimientos. Yo lo dejaría por ahí, este, no sé si haya más adelante otra oportunidad. Vale, muchas gracias Héctor. Uh, just a brief summary of Héctor's intervention uh, in response to the first question. He argues that not necessarily, gender trainers don't necessarily need to be 100% feminist activists. However, what they what is important is is that they are pro-feminist, that they are committed to feminist ideas about challenging inequality and that they are fully committed to challenging beliefs and challenging and changing beliefs and practices that um, prevent the achievement of gender equality. And that's again for the second question, um, that a key part of gender training is challenging power structures, discrimination and hierarchy. So no, it, it's not really possible to, to do feminist knowledge transfer without that. Uh, in terms of the intercultural perspective, Hector highlighted the importance of an intersectional approach in gender training, that that always needs to be there, and it's also another way of dealing with the diversity of feminisms and the diversity of feminists and participants within 
gender trainings and that that is, that is a core aspect and a core tool for gender training in dealing with um, interculturality. The final question, Hector suggested that um, UN women should play an important role in this. This kind of activity is useful in moving the discussion forward, but what is most needed are some minimum quality standards and quality criteria on which we can agree as a field and he proposed further activities of this kind including an activity um, in person whereby these issues could be discussed and we could aim to come to some kind of agreement on those minimum quality standards. Finally, I'll ask Clemencia if you would like to respond to any of these second round of questions. It all depends on how broadly or how narrowly we define activism because for us act activism is a broader definition, not just people who are in the civil society organizations advocating for gender equality, but anyone working in the academia or in international organizations or, or government institutions can be an activist as well as long as they advocate for, for gender equality. So in that sense, ideally they have to be, if, if that is the case, they have to be, uh, uh, the, trainer, the trainers need to be feminist activists and subscribe to feminist ideologies. Um, it is important, uh, diverse feminisms exist and it is important to acknowledge their existence in the training and ideally to find the common ground which exists, which is primarily around justice, equality, and fairness principles. Uh, regarding the second question, uh, I would say, I would agree with what has been said. No, uh, it's not possible if you don't address questions of power structures and hier hierarchy, then you are not serious, as someone said before, in your training. You need to abide by basic principles as well of feminism. And uh, regarding the last one, just um, we as UN uh, include intersectionality in our gender trainings, so so it is possible, and it is also our mandate of gender equality and women's rights framework, international frameworks. Thank you. Thank you, Clemencia. I'm sorry, I skipped Soline, so I do apologize for that, Soline. I will come to you now to respond to any of those four questions. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, for the first one, I, um, I will say that some trainers, they don't self-identify as feminists, or they are not labeled as feminists by other people. And, uh, well, for many reasons, they, 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 they don't say they're feminists, or they are not seen as feminists, uh, but here uh, a question raises uh, who's the right to say that someone's feminist or is not, and who's the right to say that kind of feminism is better than the other one. So um, I think here uh, maybe it would be um, more interesting to focus on practices to what change than to focus on uh, uh, people saying that they are or they are not feminist and uh, so that will be my, my answer and uh, as for uh, diverse feminism I totally agree with the, 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 the previous uh, answer. Uh, feminism is diverse and we just have to, to dialogue and to, to just dialogue and see if uh, there's mutual validation of uh, what gender expertise is about and if we can uh, find a common ground for that. Uh, the second one, uh, I will say that unfortunately <laughs> uh, some uh, trainings, uh, yeah, you can have a, on an intellectual perspective say that you're attacking power structures and uh, exclusion and discrimination but uh, in practice it's not that easy and uh, here it's a very important here to um, 
to um, be reflexive about the practices. What do I do? Do I reproduce um, inequalities in my trainings or not? And to pay continuous attention to these uh, um, processes, uh, which brings a kind of personal insecurity, but which is, uh, I think, um, very important to ensure that we are working uh, on a feminist way, always challenging our perspectives um, uh, and to, to be sure that we are not reproducing for our relations. Um, and maybe just a point as for the, the latest question, I think it's also important that uh, gender trainers and consultants um, uh, try to define on their own um, criteria and standards, uh, not to be uh, too dependent on any uh, economic or political agenda. So uh, my, um, uh, my proposal will be that, that there will be uh, endeavors uh, from the gender trainers themselves. Thank you, Celine. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the presenters today for very rich, dense and succinct presentations. Um, thank you to everyone listening for listening to us and also for providing very thought-provoking questions. I'm happy that we managed to deal with so many questions and allow for some discussion from the panelists. We warmly and openly invite you to continue to debate these questions on the virtual dialogue at the Community of Practice webpage, which you can see now on your screen. This is an open discussion forum where, which leaves a lot of space for longer format questions and answers and deeper engagement. And this virtual dialogue discussion forum will be open until the 11th of November, so there's still plenty of time to participate. You can also upload papers, um, links, and lots of resources there. There's also a background paper that's available for you to read about the collaboration with the KIT Royal Tropical Institute on professionalization. Finally, there will be a report available both of this webinar and the virtual dialogue more broadly. And the webinar itself will also be posted on the Community of Practice webpage for you to review and also to share widely with your colleagues. We would appreciate you doing that very much. So thank you once again for participating in this webinar on the professionalization of gender trainers. And we wish you a very good rest of the day. <laughs>